I hope you were able to make good use of that little break. One of the advantages of getting together like this is not only to hear our speakers and the respondents, but to engage with one another. I know there are a lot of friendships and uh, new relationships forming today, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about this Cardinal Meyer lecture. So as, a res as respondents, um, and I'll introduce them one at a time, our first respondent is Father Emery de Gaulle, who has a PhD in systematic theology. He's also the member, a member of the Catholic Protestant Ecumenical Dialogue in Nuremberg, Germany, and the author of The Art of Equanimity, a study on the theological hermeneutics of St. Anselm of Canterbury and the theology of Pope Benedict XVI, the Christocentric shift. So I think we're very much in for a treat to hear from this distinguished scholar who's on our faculty, Father Emery de Gaulle. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you very much, John, for your wonderful talk. Thank you very much for a dynamic and balanced lecture on our beloved Pope Benedict XVI, the Mozart of theology. Indeed, your excellent presentation is rich in information and judicious. The Mullen Seminary community looked very much forward to this year's Cardinal Albert Meyer lecture. Your podcasts and articles on Crooks Now provide reliable information from both Rome, the center of our Catholic faith, and from the Catholic world. One of our colleagues, who is here, Father Raymond Webb, Ray Webb, um, recently observed John Allen nimbly dances on a fence <laughs> and never falls to either side. <laughs> You're admired as a journalistic trapeze, trapeze, if I pronounce it correctly in English, trapeze artist. I'll take it. <laughs> you provide fair balanced, nuanced, and yet crisp news that cuts to the core of often very complex issues. Amid the frivolity and larmoyance contemporary news outlets and intellectuals delight in, you're witty, suspiciously joyful, and balanced in your reports. In short, your humorous agility and astonishing finesse reflect sane, wholesome, Midwestern equipoise. The American Heartland. I, I, you know I'm going to have this framed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the American Heartland can easily identify with you. Seeing you and your wife in action as journalists is certainly the very opposite to looking at the mortifyingly dull painting American Gothic by Grant Wood <laughs> on permanent exhibit in Chicago's Art Institute. <laughs> well, I'm the anti-Grant Wood. That's my takeaway Why do you look people forward every week to your reports, including myself? In 2016, the British author Stuart Jeffries published the best-selling book, The Grand Hotel Abyss, The Lies of the Frankfurt School. The title is borrowed from the Hungarian philosopher Gerd Lukács, who had considered the school and its twin, the critical theory, to lead invariably to an abyss. The Grand Hotel refers to the rather elegant style these spoiled skians of wealthy magnets had enjoyed throughout their lives. The school of philosophy, going back to the 1920s, subcutaneously dominates Western thinking ever since, at least in its more popular and crude variant from the 1960s onward. It teaches quite apodictically that all aspects of life must be considered under political categories. Everything is a question of power play 
and politics rules supreme. Everything is a question of either left or right. Even family, friendship, religion, and spirituality are seen exclusively through this political, better expressed ideological lens. The sad result is an irreconcilably fractious society on both sides of the North Atlantic Ocean, dominated by facile shibboleths endangering democracies to their very core. You happily defy such categorizations and elevate our thinking on matters of faith and the church above such banal slogans. I suspect in your case, journalism also has something to do with apostolate, with evangelizing. For this, we owe you profound admiration and gratitude. Josef Ratzinger's book, Faith and Politics, is available in English since 2018. To follow the lines of your brilliant lecture, but also in order to somehow complement it, permit me to first offer a summary of Ratzinger's reading of St. Augustine, celebrated distinction between Civitas Dei and Civitas Terrena, the city of God and the earthly city. This I base on his dissertation on Augustine's ecclesiology and on a text Josef Ratzinger wrote in the 1950s whilst teaching theology in Freising Seminary. These have never been translated into English. The second text is a paper he had delivered at an international conference on St. Augustine, 1954, in Paris. Based on this, I will then, in a second step, attempt to unfold the essence of Christian existence amid the unbridgeable tension of polis and ecclesia, of body politic and the kingdom of God, according to Josef Ratzinger, slash Pope Benedict XVI. So the question is why, as you correctly pose, pose it, why is there a disjuncture between the public figure, Pope Benedict, and the private person, Josef Ratzinger? And I believe that goes back to his, not only, but also to his differentiation between the city of God and the worldly city. That allows him to have a degree of, of equanimity, or as the seminarians know, the te terminus technicus ataraxia. <laughs> Augustine and the two cities. The new house of God is the result of the self-immolation of Jesus Christ in which we Christians join. The preceding intellectual currents in the days of Augustine that is the anti-Gnostic Christian soma, body, understanding, and the anti-Aryan exegesis of Athanasius aided Augustine in crystallizing his thoughts. The realist appreciation of the Eucharist as articulated by Tertullian, Hilary of Poitiers, and John Chrysostom leads to a sacramental ethics for Augustine. This distinguishes the body of Christ from the pagan state of deities. Thus, Augustine achieves a remarkable synthesis of the metaphysical term body. As with the anti-Donatist controversy, also here, the cohering key term is called caritas, charity. On this background, the young Ratzinger investigates Augustine's discussions of the concepts tent of God, cult, and the growth of God's temple, which in their Christian transformations also possess Christ as their constitutive foundation. This yields the insight into Christ as the ecclesial caput, that is head, and angularis, that is cornerstone, by itself the domus, the house, term is a lower form of community vis-a-vis -vis that of civitas, that is, in English, both city and citizenship. That it was a new discovery of Pope Benedict, that civitas means also ownership, 
citizenship. In Latin, with Augustine. Nevertheless, as a house of God, it denotes a pneumatic, supernatural, and celestial edifice. Jesus Christ's temple is Wohnstätte and lebendiges Opfer für Gott, both abode and living sacrifice for God. This edifice is the supernatural Einheit im Glauben und in der Liebe, unity in faith and in charity. While well, forcefully enunciated, unambiguously formulated, and adding original accents, Ratzinger stresses that Augustine's ecclesiology is in no way idiosyncratic, but the organic outgrowth of his engagement with scripture and Christian thinkers. Augustine sees the enduring polarity inherent to the figure of the two cities and citizenships expressed in the Old Testament by the image of the cities of Jerusalem and Babylon. It prefigures the polarity encountered in the confrontation of the ecclesia, of the church, there versus the city and state of Rome. Rome is but a metaphorical chiffre or figure for the transitory nature of the world, dramatically underscored by Alaric's pillage of putatively eternal Rome in 410 AD. Amid the trabais of the world, the populus dei, living the sacraments of church, owns a dignity unperturbed by the vicissitudes of human history, as inherently uncontestable in her essential nature by contingent reality. This comes about through and in the Opfer des lebendigen Gottes zu sein durch die Caritas im Leibe Jesu Christi, that is, to be the sacrifice of the living God by virtue of being charity in the body of Christ. The Old Testament image of people of God anticipates the Christian church as the definitive people of God. And yet, aber ihr empirisches Volk ist gleichfalls nur Bild für das wahre Volk. But its empirical people is mere image for the true people. Most deliberately, Augustine derives his understanding of the church as house of God from a theological reflection on the physical church building. Therein one can detect, according to Ratzinger, a conscious antithesis to the Old Testament's preliminary and partially still pagan and therefore necessarily superficial understanding of cult centered around the temple on Mount Sinai, on Mount uh, Zion. For this reason, Ratzinger interprets Augustine skipping over the house of God concept to the living people of God, of the Ecclesia Sive Congregatio, church or assembly, inchoately hinted at by the physical house of God. In the body of Christ, both the adoratio and the inhabitatio, the adoration and the indwelling of God occur. Ratzinger discovers in the study that Augustine uses terms like fundamentum, petra, edificare, and compagis caritatis, foundation, rock, to build an incorporation into a framework of charity to describe the tangible and sacramental reality called church. Using such images, he defines the essence of the church as being grounded in a community of faith and charity in Christ. Little wonder, in the ecclesiology of Augustine, the term house of God is merely an interpretive tool, but wholly deficient in, un in conveying the essence of the Christian church. See, she is the one catholica, the universal reality, uniting omnis gentis, all peoples, to una gens, to one people. Grounded ontologically in God, she is the civitas, 
endowed with the Holy Spirit as the pilgrim colony on earth. The intersection of cult and sacrament generates the body of Christ. This Latin term, Corpus Christi, is neither mythical nor blurry, but eminently concrete as the unus panis, unum corpus, sumus multi, the one bread, as one body, we are many. As Ratzinger quotes Augustine's memorable line. While the terms people of God and city of God have pre-Christian origins, the notion of Corpus Christi, body of Christ, rests on the reality of the sacrificing church. In the conclusion to his dissertation, Ratzinger points to the Doctor Grazie, seeing the angels included in the church. People of God and body of Christ are not mutually excluding entities. Rather, Corpus Christi expresses the inner reality, which is imperfectly circumscribed by the secular terms civitas and populus, city and people. The civitas dei concept is of decisive import for Augustine's and Ratzinger's thinking. Yet Ratzinger has given it only passing attention in some of his writings, a mere, pre, a mere three pages in his dissertation. This he compensates when reacting in 1954 to Wilhelm Kamla's interpretation of Augustine's teaching on Civitas Dei with a paper delivered at a conference in Paris. A Protestant theologian turned philosopher, Kamla had anticipated Bultmann's thesis of demythologization de and regarded Christianity as having undergone a profound alteration when encountering Greek culture, a la the Pro Protestant German dogma historian Adolf von Harnack. Ratzinger notes with a surprise that Kamla also sees Civitas Dei denoting Bürgerschaft Gottes, God's citizenship just as Ratzinger had done in his dissertation three years earlier. However, Kamla uses Augustine's term civitas dei to designate merely a contingent Lutheran Gemeinde, that is parish. Ratzinger takes exception with such an ideological construction, which contradicts both scriptural and patristic evidence. Kamla's claim that Civitas Dei um, stands for a Christian parish is contradicted early on in Christianity by Clement, Tertullian, Augustine, and Ambrose. In addition, Ambrose refers to the ecclesial Jerus Jerusalem as the city of God. Kamla lacks appreciation for the concreteness of the New Testament term ecclesia and the allegorical concept city of God as utilized in the Old Testament. Sensitized by the pill pillage of Rome in 410, Augustine embraces now a fortiori, the use of the concept city of God, namely as an apology against the idolatrous civitas deorum city, Rome, the city of deities. Ratzinger elaborates that the civitas Romanorum, the state of the Romans, relates to the civitas Dei as letter relates to spirit. Rome is but yet an other historic manifestation of the worldly civitas confusionis, city of confusion, symbolized in the Old Testament by vainglorious Babylon. However, the church as city is secundum spiritum, according to the Holy Spirit, and thereby owns an eschatological perspective wholly alien to ancient Rome. Ratzinger faults Kamla for not apprehending the unity of the four interrelated dimensions, empirical, eschatological, sacramental, and personal holiness. Such ecclesial unity is empirical, and yet in the priest's sursum corda, lift up your hearts of the Eucharist 
the faithful express heaven as their actual home when joining in Christ's sacrifice to the Father. Paraphrasing a famous line from Con Confessions 14.28, Ratzinger writes, the center of the city, the point from which it unfolds, is her caritas, her love. The earthly city is marked by a self-love that verges on contempt of God, while the city of God is being edified through a love of God, verging on contempt of self. Come last 20th century categories of empirical, theocratic, and idealistic, like the philosophical current, are ultimately not helpful. The church is primarily and essentially both pneumatic and sacramental. The city of God is the church as the community of members of the body of Christ. She is the pneumatic polis of God. On earth, within and beyond the state, she feels alien and awaits, in fact pines for the world to come. This irreconcilable difference between heaven and earth, between the city of God and the terrestrial city does not lead to stasis, but to a fruitful tension leading to discipleship in the hic et nunc. To Pope Benedict, theology is only credible if it leads to mystagogy, lest it suffers shipwreck as a merely academic l'art pour l'art. As a, excess, a futile exercise. Divine revelation is not about sharing information, but about healing, restoring the divine human relationship. Theology means participating in God's creative utterances to the world. This can only be the case if it is at the same time mystagogy, namely lead leading to the mystery of the personal triune God. This explains the final grand accord of Ratzinger's theological oeuvre, that is, of the Jesus of Nazareth trilogy. This work transforms theology into mystagogy. In this trilogy, we sense something of the spirit of the neo-patristic synthesis, as had been intended by the noted emigre Russian Orthodox priest and theologian Georges Florovsky. Jesus of Nazareth is patristic, speculative, modern, personalist, and thoroughly based on the most recent insights of the historical critical method. And yet, it transcends these. It becomes Christ's own inviting gesture to participate in his triune life. This trilogy is not merely critical a la Immanuel Kant, but is the first post-critical Christology. It invites to meditation and prayer. Amid the tension of the two civitates, there is the reconciling center that is Christian existence. It is no coincidence that the idea of a Wesenschafte, a Wesenhafte Verbindung, essential connection between cult and liturgy, dogmatics and ethics, runs like a hidden thread through Josef Ratzinger's theological thinking. He is concerned with the genuinely Christian concept of logos, the beginning of cre creation and the beginning of redemption is the one divine will. From this then grows order for humankind. Revelation stands at the beginning of faith. Humankind is, as it were, in the passive. First God acts actively in history. The human person should respond to this in his or her own life story. Even in his early best-selling work, Introduction to Christianity, Josef Ratzinger formulated the concept of Christian charity succinctly and programmatically. In the Christian faith, 
man comes to the most profound sense of himself, not through what he does, but through what he accepts. He must, oh, he must wait for the gift of charity, and love can only be received as a gift. Liturgy as a prelude to eternal life. For Ratzinger, reflection on the charity imparted by God is sparked by the celebrated liturgy as a gift of God, God's living space, as it were in the place of, once, of the once promised land of Canaan. In liturgical worship, God's absolute charity is first received as an unclaimed and yet deeply vital gift and vouched for as culture. Josef Ratzinger describes liturgy as a prelude to the future eternal life of which St. Augustine says that in contrast to the present life, it is no longer woven out of need and necessity, but entirely out of the freedom of giving and giving. In biblical terms, the Christian cult is Pascha liturgy. It is a ritualized exodus, the Old Testament exodus from the slave house of sin and reaching the profound promised land, which takes the place of the lost garden of paradise in order to serve God there, to enjoy God there, Fui Dei, delight in God, maybe that's the best translation in English, is Augustine's laconic definition of eternity. It characterizes the essence of human freedom to be able to face the question of ultimate meaning and ultimate logic, and not to be allowed to avoid it. The human being, by nature, can, may, and should trust the ever superior logic of God and his charity and respond to it with his life in charity. The path to culture is only possible from the cult. The tension that emerges at Sinai between the inner land of worship, that is the forum internum of sacrament and grace, the church in the proper sense, and the outer land of law, that is the forum externum of law and justice, the state as a space of justice, and the necessary tension between these two spiritual landscapes is decisive. Only the inner land, the land of God's charity, makes, out, makes the outer land of justice and law habitable. And only this understanding of the cult as the inner backbone of a second nature of justice, which has taken the place of the first lost nature of charity, enables a correct understanding of culture. Human law and its arbitrary laws then appear as an institutionalized ethos that guarantees the moral water table of pure survival, the minimum guarantee of goodness that is necessary to enable human coexistence. Such law only guarantees a peaceful life, not a life of perfect peace or charity. In essence, law and ethics are not human creations, even if they belong to the realm of created and written culture. Law and morality are formulations of the primordial sense of a world conducive to God, life that God has placed in human natural reason. Law and ethics are based on the kind of natural law that can also be described as rational law or personal law. This is an insight into the truly good that is given to humankind and historically achieved. Human beings retrace the traces of God's loving logic with powers of reason and the spirit. The inner land of worship is to which the outer land of law and ethics should correspond is God's own land and the space of his unlimited charity. In this respect, Christian liturgy is really an anticipation 
and prelude to God's good eternity and the outer land to the institutions of constitutional politics is also a view of the eternal goodness of God to who calls the human person and gives him the opportunity to respond to. This response takes the form of the celebration of God's presence and the observance of the law. This brings into view the space of political action and a specifically Augustinian impregnated theology of history, which moves from the inside to the outside, from the virtue of the heart to the institution of the state. In the Augustinian tradition, the state means the minimum morale in history as the institu institutionalization and guarantee of the fundamental right to life and integrity. The new man is created through inner conversion and recognition of divine life in the distinctiveness of his own life. Only in becoming and growth through reform from the beginning and through transformation or even more precisely, through inner conversion instead of outer revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Father Emery. Our next respondent is Dr. Ted Wapham, the dean of our new school of parish leadership and evangelization. Dr. Wapham is a theologian specializing in Christology and Trinitarian theology. His books include The Unity of Theology, The Contribution of Wolfhard Pannenberg, and the term person in the Trinitarian theology of Wolfhard Pannenberg. Excuse me. So if you want to learn about the term person, Ted is the one to tell us about it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I too want to extend my thanks to John Allen, uh, not only for uh, his insight that he shared with us today and his wisdom, but in particular for your vocation as a journalist. Uh, to echo Father Emery's sentiments, uh, in a world that's so fraught and in a church that is too frequently fought, fraught by polarization and sensationalism, uh, John Allen's work as an editor as a journalist and as a writer, consistently seeks to, in his own words, at his best, to simply describe what's going on and to allow his readers to make their own decisions. We know how deeply this is needed in our world today, and you do us all a great service by sharing that with us in your writing and with us here today. Father Emery, thank you as well for your erudite response and for elucidating the Augustinian roots of uh, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, John pa uh, Pope Benedict XVI's uh, theological vision, and in particular, the way that he sought to speak to culture, uh, the way that he sought to re-Christianize Europe uh, and uh, the contrast between the city of God and the city of man. <clears throat> Uh, my poor efforts uh, will, will uh, uh, lamentably be short and uh, less insightful than my predecessors. <clears throat> uh, my expertise, such that it may or may not be, in Benedict XVI comes from uh, a course that I've taught on the history of the contemporary papacy that looks at uh, the life of the, the popes and, and the, the pastoral leadership of pontiffs beginning with uh, Pio Nono, the Pius IX, and continuing through uh, Pope Francis. Uh, and so uh, the focus of my comments will be uh, in that sort of broad historical sweep <clears throat> and uh, more pastorally oriented uh, to the style of his leadership and governance of the universal church. So the first of the comments that I'd like to make um, is, has been echoed in a number of ways, which is Benedict XVI's uh, emphasis on a hermeneutic of continuity, both in his uh, work as a theologian, uh, as the prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, uh, and as pontiff and as uh, Pope Emeritus. In all of these roles, uh, Benedict XVI sought to continue to preach 
the long sweep of God's presence in history and the steadiness of God's hand uh, as it continues to move forward uh, in uh, its presence. So as prefect of the Congregation of Doctrine of Faith, uh, he worked with uh, Pope John Paul II to continue to implement the council and sought to um, tamp down some of the more radical elements, the, those who theologians who sought to view uh, Vatican II as an element of discontinuity, as a major shift, and rather helped to place the Second Vatican Council in the broad swath of continuity of the church's teaching, especially that of Trent and the First Vatican Council. He also embodied that in the fact that his own pontificate, his own life history, he was deeply involved in the work of the uh, uh, pontiff of, of Pope John Paul II, his own pontificate, and he continued to be evolved, involved, although uh, at times in a, in a controversial way or uh, unclear way, in the, the pontificate of Pope Francis. Uh, we've seen uh, discussions in popular culture, uh, a movie recently, and, and speculations about the exact nature of their relationship. But in, in tracking out what it means to be a Pope Emeritus, he continued to demonstrate many things for us. And I think that at the root of this is this same notion of continuity. He continued to offer uh, balance and insight, never, uh, uh, never overstepping, never uh, contradicting. <clears throat> Uh, at times as a, a, a bishop and as a, a Pope Emeritus sharing concerns, um, but always seeking to uh, work obediently to the will of the universal church as it's uh, exemp exemplified in, uh, in the work of the Pope in the, in the office of the Bishop of Rome. So this theme of continuity, I think, was deeply important to his life. Indeed, I think it, it can be seen in his uh, choice of his name uh, as uh, Pope, as Benedict, both in uh, continuing to take up the, the work of Benedict XV, who sought to re-Christianize Europe uh, and to bring those emphases back, uh, and uh, perhaps even more deeply uh, to, to, to take... Um, solace and to draw strength from the monastic roots of Europe uh, and the patronage of Benedict of Nursia and, and the, the, the role of monasticism both um, in his pontificate, in the ways that he tried to establish that rhythm in his daily routines, and uh, most clearly in his retirement as Pope Emeritus where he joined in the life of a monastery. That that stability, <clears throat> that notion of a, of a steady hand, uh, and the humility that comes with it uh, is such a clear part of his work. On the other hand, <clears throat> and there were references made to this in our earlier conversations, in a, in a course that deals with um, pastoral leadership and governance, uh, it's hard to look at the pontificate of Benedict XVI and not recognize the great administrative challenges of his pontificate. <clears throat> uh, he, his, uh, his pontificate was beset uh, over and over again by controversies, some of which, uh, many of which, were the result of uh, difficulty with communicating with uh, contemporary media uh, and uh, allowing himself to be misinterpreted, uh, not getting in, uh, in advance of uh, uh, stories that had seemed to get out of hand. Uh, and part of it, too, uh, was in his own choice of leadership within the, the, the life of the church. When Benedict, uh, before his election, uh, the conclave sought uh, a, a bishop, uh, a pope who would be able to begin a process of um, reorganizing and restructuring the curia after a long pontificate of John Paul II. Benedict was clear in uh, his voice that uh, he did not think he would be uh, an ideal choice. Uh, so perhaps, John, you're uh, uh, well... Um, uh, you could be forgiven for your three or four reasons as to why he would never be the Pope. <clears throat> um, but uh, 
and part of that was that the task of administration, I think he would recognize and would say, was not his gift. Uh, he chose uh, people for positions who weren't always able to do the job, uh, perhaps for his love of his fellow man and his sense of loyalty that led him to, uh, to overlook uh, uh, inabilities, uh, uh, gaps in people's skill level. And that led to, <clears throat> in part, I think, the gap that John spoke to between his public image and who he was as a person. Uh, and uh, I too was among uh, those who, when he was first elected, uh, was concerned about what the pontificate might be like and was quickly surprised um, at how different the image of Pope Den Benedict was than the role of uh, uh, prefect of the Congregation of Doctrine of Faith. <clears throat> and uh, that his, his emphasis on caritas, his emphasis on love, which imbues his work, his emphasis on reason uh, comes through over and over again. And I think it's a real shame uh, that, that that message wasn't able to be better heard because uh, of the way that the church was managed during his period. Uh, the numbers of controversies were, were well aware of. Uh, the uh, sex abuse crisis reached its zenith during his pontificate. Uh, and uh, it was a time of serious challenges. We spoke about the, the Vatty Leak uh, uh, scandal, if you will, uh, and challenges within the life of the church that continued to come up during his pontificate. And so his uh, example uh, of us for stepping down and being able to say that he was no longer up for the role uh, mentally and physically up to the role, <clears throat> I think was a great gift to us. So I'll leave with those, those last two comments, uh, just the, the notion of uh, the stability that he sought to provide uh, and the notion, the hermeneutic of continuity that throughout his writings and throughout his personhood he sought to restore and the challenges that he had in communicating that as pastor of the Universal Church with the challenges in his management. Well, thank you. Uh, John, do you want to respond to any of the uh, comments of the faculty respondents? Um, and, then, and then we can open it up for Q&A after that. Am I on? Hello? Hello? Uh, well, Father Emery, that was uh, dazzling in its brilliance, and I don't just mean all the nice stuff you said about me. All <laughs> that clearly is the top note, um, but, uh, but th that was just a remarkable tour de force, what I understood, which was not a lot, to be real honest. Uh, but, but it sounded great, you know, as we say in Italian, se non è vero e ben trovato. If it's not true, it sounded fantastic. Uh, and, and Ted, thank you. Forse troppo, huh? Non esageriamo. Uh, and Ted, thank you very much. I think all of the points you just made were, were absolutely spot on. I think the, the emphasis on continuity, certainly, and, and this notion of Benedict is kind of a steadying sort of you know, dose of stability. One of the great ironies about the train wreck uh, that his papacy was on a managerial basis was how this great apostle of stability presided over a papacy that in many ways was anything but stable uh, and, and created the basis for a number of upheavals uh, that we are still watching you know, play out, but, but in any event, great instincts. Uh, I think that's it. I think now that the smart thing to do is open it up and see where great. we go. So let's open it up for any uh, questions from the audience. You can raise your hand and we'll, we'll uh, have roving microphones. Here we go. Uh, this question is for any of you three. Regarding the public image of Pope Benedict as kind of this cold man, I think a lot of parishioners in the pews kind of still have that image. Um, are there any stories that you could share of him from your knowledge of him that might maybe combat that image that we could share with them to maybe help in that regard? Well, I mean, I think those, those stories are actually kind of legion. I mean, the, the problem with it is, and I think and Ted was absolutely right, there was a persistent and chronic communications problem during the Benedict papacy that obscured most of this stuff from view. But I mean, sure, I'll, I'll give you a couple of stories. I mean, for example, uh, when Benedict went to the UK in 2010, 
Um, British Catholics were clamoring for him to go to Birmingham and beatify John Henry Newman. They wanted that to be the kind of capstone event on this trip, right? Now, one of the few things that, one of the few elements of discontinuity between Benedict and John Paul actually is that Benedict changed the practice. It used to be John Paul did all the beatifications and canonizations himself. He liked a big show, okay, uh, and loved this stuff. Um, Benedict, however, being the precise theologian that he was, understood that beatification is technically an act for the local church, canonization is an act for the universal church, and so he decided that the Pope would no longer perform beatifications. The British Catholics were like, no, no, please, you gotta do it, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. So uh, he had a meeting with his trip planner, Alberto Gaspari, veteran guy, uh, who you know did all the nuts and bolts of planning the trips. Um, and Gaspari brought this up and said, uh, you know, Holy Father, a lot of people would love to see you do this beatification. Uh, to which uh, Benedict's response was, well, gosh, I don't know. I mean, what do you think, Alberto? Do you think it would be okay if I made an, an exception? To which his reaction was, what are you asking me for? You're the Pope, you don't need my permission, <laughs> right? Uh, but that was just Benedict's style. I mean, he, he, he you talked about the, the idea of, the, of faith being not something you create, but something you accept in the first instance, right? I think he was very conscious of that all the time, that, that he understood himself to be the steward and the guardian of a tradition that was much bigger than himself, and he never wanted to impose his own will on it. That's why this rap about him being some kind of autocrat, autocrat is just absolutely crazy. Like, of the three popes I've covered, he was by far the least autocratic guy uh, that I've covered. I mean, John Paul and Francis, they are strong medicine. You know, they, they have very clear visions, and they don't brook opposition, you know, particularly well uh, some of the time. Uh, you know, uh, that was just never Benedict at all. I, I mean, a, you know, another story, I remember the, the first time I met him actually, we were in San Francisco, and it, he, had, he had gone out to do a doctrinal consultation, he was meeting with some bishops, and there was a reception at the, at the seminary afterwards. And he had come down, he, back then his secretary was still Bishop Clemens, this was before Gainswine got appointed. And so he and Clemens came in the room, and uh, nobody at first noticed that he was there, right? Um, so uh, Clemens goes off to find, uh, I, I think it was Archbishop Levade at the time, goes off to find Levade to tell him that the Ratzinger is in the room. In the meantime, he's just kind of looking around and not quite sure what to do with himself. Um, and so I walked over and asked, you know, your eminence, is there anything I can do for you? Do for you? And he's like, do you think it would be all right if I got a glass of Fanta? <laughs> I said, I think if you wanted, there are guys who would line up around the block to go raid the 7-Eleven to bring you crates of the stuff, if that's actually what you want, right? Uh, but he was just so sweet, he, he didn't want to, like, be a nuisance uh, to anyone. So that's Benedict in a nutshell, and I mean, you know, th those examples are just legion. The difficulty was, and I think there were moments when his public narrative began to catch up with that reality. I mean, I think of his meeting with the abuse victims in the States, you know, when that happened in 2008. You know, we had those, those people on CNN afterwards, and I mean, to a person, I mean, all, they were moved beyond words uh, at how obviously heart sick he was, uh, you know, listening to their suffering. You mentioned that the, the sex abuse crisis came to an apex under Benedict. Well, I think he inherited a crisis rather than having manufactured it. And by the way, it is far from over. I mean, you know, the, the aftershocks are still being felt in this papacy, too. So, I, look, uh, I, I agree with you. I think at the popular level, in terms of what people remember about Benedict, even sometimes in the pews, there still is some of this thing about him being this kind of sturm and drong, harsh, aloof, guy, right, this kind of cold fish. Um, I think the, the best way to combat, well, the, the, there are two ways. One is putting those people in contact with people who, who actually physically knew Benedict, because I think that's a great antidote. The other thing, really, is read his work. I mean, I don't think you can read Deus Caritas Est, for instance, and come away with the impression that this is kind of some unfeeling automaton. I mean, the, the, the passion he had for, for human love that, 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 you know, percolates through every syllable uh, of that document uh, is just palpable. I mean, in other words, the image will not survive contact with the reality in the long run.
Uh, okay, you all got the question. Is Francis going to resign as Benedict did? Uh, you remember, okay, first of all, spoiler alert, remember what I said earlier about me not being Nostradamus? Okay, just <laughs> do bear that in mind, okay? Uh, that said, it's not going to stop me from answering this question, but I'm just letting you know I may be full of it. Um, I have come full circle on this, okay? When, when Bergoglio was elected, I was completely convinced that his papacy was going to end in resignation. Um, and this is because it, he has, in his own lifetime, lived through not one, but two historically unprecedented resignations. Because it wasn't just Benedict. Remember, Bergoglio was also a Jesuit. Um, and it used to be, of course, for centuries, that the Jesuit superior always ruled for life. And it wasn't until Father Kolbenbach resigned in the 90s that the Jesuits ever had such a thing as a retired superior general. Uh, and so twice Bergoglio saw this play out. Something that was considered unthinkable happens, and you know, the wheels don't go off, right? I mean, you know, life goes on. Uh, and plus, uh, when he was uh, elected at the beginning, he also said on many occasions he thought his would be a short papacy, which seemed to lead one to the hypothesis that perhaps he was planning on resignation at some point. Uh, that's what I thought 10 years ago. Um, that is not at all what I think today. Today, I think it is exactly the opposite. I think you were going to have to pry the papacy out of his cold, dead hands. Um, uh, I, I think th the truth of it is uh, that uh, I fundamentally believe, and this is one strong element of contrast between Francis and Benedict, or uh, in continuity between Francis and, and John Paul. John Paul and Francis both enjoyed being pope. They liked the gig. Okay, they enjoyed being in command. Uh, they had both been in leadership their entire lives. John Paul became an auxiliary bishop in Poland in his 30s. Bergoglio became a Jesuit superior in Argentina in his 30s. They're very they're comfortable in their own skin and comfortable in command. Benedict never was, right? Um, the, the pope I see before me today, Pope Francis, I think is having a blast. Uh, I think he is just, he is enjoying the ride. Um, and I think there is sometimes even a slightly mischievous side to his personality where he enjoys consternating his critics uh, and enjoys sort of driving them a little nuts uh, every now and then. I think all of that is part of the package. Uh, and so my take now, now of course, this is absent some debilitating medical condition that makes resignation essentially uh, you know, uh, in a, inescapable. But absent that, uh, no, I, I think he, continue, he intends to continue as long as his energies hold out on his capable of doing it. And by the way, uh, you know, apropos of the Pope's health, I would just say that uh, although, you know, I'm sure we all know the, uh, the, the issues that he has had, and certainly he has a collection of maladies, right? Uh, beginning with the loss of part of one lung as a young man, the sciatica he suffers from, the, the arthritis in the right knee, the colon surgery he's had, and on and on. But none of that is life-threatening. Uh, and he has recently, of course, been forced to uh, renounce some, some talks because he's been struggling with bronchitis, but that's not life-threatening either. Uh, and frankly, the, the energy level that I see in this pope leads me to believe that he may be good to go for a while yet. Or to put it differently, I've covered papal transitions. I know the vibe in the people around the Pope when they believe the end may be drawing near. That is not the vibe we get today. Uh, the vibe we get today is that Francis and his team fully intend to see this Senate of Bishops through uh, in October, and they're gearing up for the Jubilee year in 2025. So, no, I don't see a resignation in our near-term future. Now, watch, I'm gonna get home tomorrow and that's gonna be the Vatican <laughs> News Bulletin, right? Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Mike Canaris. I'm a theologian at Loyola University Chicago. And I actually, I'm the last doctoral student of Avery Dulles. Uh, wow. I was his assistant for five years. Wow. And I see some parallels here because I, I want to raise the question or, the, or have a little conversation around maybe the discontinuity or at least the transition in their theological vision. Because, you know, the, 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 the models of the church, Avery Dulles, and the first things Avery Dulles, there was certainly a transition now. Now, to his viewpoint was that he had not changed. The world had changed around him, right? So that you go from sort of the, the conflicts with a manual theology of a pre-Vatican II era to uh, sort of defending the apex of the hierarchy of truths. And his position was constant. The world had changed around him. I'm not sure I agree with that, but that was his own vision of 
of his transition. So we know that, you know, early on, Benedict or Ratzinger then working closely with Rahner, saying the wall of Latinity needs to be breached in the liturgy, these questions that don't exactly square with what comes later. Perhaps you could see an organic transition through. But, you know, a lot of people say it's that 1968 moment with the student protests. And I think there's a story about a microphone being ripped out of his hands when he's giving a lecture on campus or something. And he sees that the, the world is, the tectonic plates, as you said, are shifting in the world. And so he has to respond accordingly. But can you say a little bit about that, about the, the sort of transition that takes place from the early Ratzinger's writings to the later? Because there's certainly a, a bit of a change there. Sure. So uh, fundamentally, you know, the one rap on Ratzinger all along was that as a young man, he was a liberal and then he, he shifted to the right progressively. Uh, and his critics would argue that he did that in part to, to advance his ecclesiastical career because that was the way the winds were blowing in the church at the time. Um, you know, how much truth is there to that? Well, I, you are absolutely right. There is no difference. There is no question that there is a difference in tonality, at least, if not, if not entirely in substance, between the Ratzinger of Introduction to Christianity, for instance, uh, and Ratzinger of the Doctrinal Prefect 20 or 30 years later. Um, now, you know, not to get too far down into the weeds, but I, I think, you know, the, the way that Ratzinger himself would have understood that uh, <laughs> is that at the time of the council, uh, you know, the overwhelming majority at the council was the progressives who wanted change, right? Um, the, the problem with any reform movement is that it is often easier to specify what you were against than what you were for. That they were against a kind of stultifying scholasticism that had taken hold in the church in the 50s and the early 60s, and they wanted to break through that. But break through it to what? Uh, and in that progressive majority, there were always, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but two sort of broad currents, right? There was the aggiornamento current that wanted the, the church to modernize, to open up the windows, right? To, to make its peace with secular modernity. In other words, it was an instinct that looked forward. Uh, and then there was the ressourcement current that tended to look backwards. I mean, tended to look at recapturing the patristic legacy of the church that it felt scholasticism had artificially sort of truncated, right? Uh, and I think Ratzinger certainly would have understood himself at the time and definitely later looking back uh, as part of that race or Samant school. And of course, in, in, the, in the split there, of course, we saw in what happened after the council with, uh, you know, Comunio and Concilium, right? I mean, the aggiornamento crowd ends up with Concilium and the, the race or Samant crowd ends up with Comunio, right? So I think he would have seen this as there was a, a sort of false perspective at the time of the council that everyone was in overwhelming agreement as to where the church needed to go. In reality, he would have said, there was overwhelming agreement about what it needed to surmount, but in service to what agenda at that point wasn't resolved. And I think he would see the evolution of his thinking as part of a natural development uh, of that. But I mean, look, I also think to some extent, the aspects of, of Ratzinger's thinking that got brought out at particular moments didn't depend just on evolutions in his own thinking or ideology. It also had to do with what the circumstances required of him. I mean, let's bear in mind that for the 20 plus years that he was the prefect of the Holy Office, I mean, that, that, that job is a little bit analogous to being like the dean of men in a Catholic high school. Right? I mean, you're the guy who has to write out the penalty period forms when a kid has his shirt untucked or something, right? I mean, you know, you become the, you become the doctor no of the place. It is not a prescription for winning friends and influencing people, right? Um, but I think, the, you know, people thought that in some ways Benedict became a new person when he became pope. No, he didn't. He had a new role. I mean, as the prefect of the Holy Office, it was often his role to draw lines in the sand that was inevitably baked into the cake. But as Pope, what he, what he emphasized was that he no longer had, his, no lo his primary responsibility was no longer to say no, it was instead to say yes. Because he would have believed that those specific no's are in service to a broader yes. Christianity place, does not seek to place restrictions on people for the sake of it. It seeks to point a pathway to authentic human happiness and flourishing. In other words, we only say no ever in service to a larger yes. Uh, and as Pope, he had the opportunity to put the spotlight on that yes, right? So I think some of it is evolutions in his thinking. Some of it is the fact that I, I think there was a great deal at the time of the council that had to be unpacked in terms of where it was going to go and inevitably differences emerged uh, in the course of that. And some of it also has to do with circumstance, right? 
Could you share the story of the first time you met Pope Francis? <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Um, so this was 2001. And th this is one improbability stacked on top of another, OK? And 2001, we had a synod of bishops in Rome. It was the synod on bishops. So it was the synod of bishops about bishops, OK? Um, which is probably the silliest thing until the synod of bishops on synodality, <laughs> right? Um, uh, but uh, in any event, uh, this synod was taking place in October 2001. Now, you may remember a little something happened in September 2001 in the United States, right? Now, the relator of that synod was supposed to be then Archbishop Ed Egan of New York. I don't think he'd gotten his red hat yet. Um, but Egan, of course, like this was a month after 9-11, right? The Archbishop of New York could not be in Rome for a month, like right after the Twin Towers came down. Right um, now, Egan was—I uh, mean, it's a sweet man, God rest his soul—but he, he was not exactly what I would call media friendly. Like, if he had never had to see another journalist in his life, that would have been his foretaste of paradise. Forget the liturgy, Father. Sorry, but it would just be a reporter-free zone, you know. Uh, and he would have thought he had died and gone to heaven. But for some reason, he had agreed to give me an interview. Uh, the opening week of the Senate, okay? However, he had to pull out, right? Um, and so, in a, a fit of generosity that I don't understand where this came from, Egan actually called up the guy who was replacing him as the chairman of the Senate, who happened to be the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, and said, okay, look, uh, there's this American reporter, and I told him I would give him an interview, but I can't be here, I've gotta go home. Would you mind meeting with this guy? Now, Bergoglio hated journalists at that point in his career almost as much as Egan did. Right, do you realize that in the 15 years he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he gave five interviews over the course of those entire 15 years? The guy gives five interviews before lunch now. Okay, uh, so, you know, talk about transitions from cardinal to pope. I mean, dear Lord. Um, but in any event, Bergoglio, so one media-averse bishop asks another media-averse bishop to give an interview, and for reasons that surpass all understanding, he agreed. Okay, so we set up this appointment. I was going to go meet him at the uh, Casa Santa Marta. You know, that's the residence on Vatican grounds where he lives now. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been to the Santa Marta. But uh, you walk in, and there are these like sliding glass doors when you walk up, and the doors open. And then there are these spiral staircases on either side that take you down to the reception area. And so when you're meeting a potentate of the church, you go in. Well, first of all, now there's a Swiss guard out front because the pope's there, but there didn't used to be in the old days. So you go through these sliding glass doors, and you go down to the staircase, and you go to the desk, and you announce, I am here to see his eminence or his excellency so-and-so. The guy in the white tux behind the desk picks up the phone, calls up to their room, gets their flunky on the phone. The flunky says, uh, okay, uh, you know, his eminence or his excellency will be down. You get shoved in a waiting room. 10 or 15 minutes later, the great man shows up, okay? This is how it always works. So that day, uh, I am running a little late, and I, so I'm kind of chugging my way, uh, and I go in the sliding glass doors, and I'm about to, to go down the staircase, when out of the corner of my eye, I see this guy sitting on a folding chair wearing clerical blacks, right? And it, it just, I, I don't know what he's doing there, but I stopped basically just to say hello, and he looks at me and he says, uh, Le e Allen, meaning, are you Allen? Uh, and I'm like, uh, yes. I'm thinking maybe this is like the Archbishop's secretary. He seemed a little old for the gig, frankly, but, you know, okay. Uh, and the guy says, sono Bergoglio, you know, I'm Bergoglio. I'm like, oh, uh, okay, uh, your excellency will, you know, gee, uh, great to meet you. Um, and he says, uh, where would you like to talk? We could probably get another chair. And I said, I don't, you don't really know how this works, do you? Because if you go downstairs and tell them you want a room, they're going to give you a room, right? Uh, and he says, no, it's okay. I said, all right, let, let me handle it. Uh, and, you know, I went down to the reception desk and said, uh, his, his excellency would like a meeting room. And there's like, oh, of course. And you know, now all of a sudden there are three or four guys escorting us into this thing. And so we go into this room and then Bergoglio looks at me and says, you know, would you like some coffee or some water? We got a little kitchen in the back. I could go, I'm like, you really don't get it. 
just tell one of those guys and they will bring you anything you want on a silver platter. You know, uh, now, and at the time, like, I just thought this was all charming. What, what I realized, watching him in action as Pope, so I was misreading the situation. It's not that he didn't get it. He knew full well that if he wanted to throw his, his weight around, he could have. Uh, it's just that he didn't want to do it. Uh, and that is one part, I think, his genuine simplicity, uh, that you know, he, he doesn't like the idea of having a team of servants catering to his needs all the time. But, but there's also a personality trait there, which is um, Pope Francis does not like being dependent on anyone for anything. Right? I mean, this is why, for instance, you know, uh, John Paul II had the same priest secretary for the entire course of his almost 27-year papacy, Stanislaw Jeevish, right? They had a symbiotic father-son relationship, and Jeevish was the authentic interpreter of John Paul's mind. With Benedict, it was the same thing with Archbishop Gainswine. Pope Francis, by my count, at this stage in his papacy, has had 11 different priest secretaries. Why? Because he doesn't want anybody who is able to speak authoritatively in his name. He wants to do that for himself, right? Do, do you realize the man keeps his own schedule? He carries a little brown, black notebook in his shirt pocket, and you know he will say, uh, hey, can you come by and see me at four o'clock? And he'll just like, write it in the notebook, and he's the only one who knows what the hell's going on. Like, the, the Vatican puts out an official schedule every day with his official appointments, but that's only the tip of the iceberg, right? And, I mean, the stories at the Santa Marta are, are legion that guys are rolling in there saying, yeah, I've got an appointment with the Pope, and they're like, what? You know, uh, but it's it just, you know, he makes his own phone calls, you know? I mean, he's a legendary cold caller, and all of this, he doesn't like the sense of being handled. So what, and I now understand that with the benefit of retrospect. You know, at the time, I thought he was this, Naïf, right? Uh, this ingenue that was, that was in over his head in a system that he didn't understand. Um, you know, what I've come to appreciate is that he knew the system very well. He just didn't want to play the system's game. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. I see up here. Okay, Brian? Yeah. I, sure, sure. Uh, you mean Benedict and Francis? Uh, well, I, in some ways, I probably could speak more knowledgeably about John Paul's prayer life of the three popes I have covered, simply because um, back in those days, you would have the opportunity to go to uh, his, daily, his private daily mass in, in the papal chapel, and so I had the opportunity to observe him at prayer up close and personal quite often. Um, I, I think the... Benedict very much was, I mean, obviously, a, a deep man of prayer, and in, in his retirement, you know, one of the standing things that people would want to do uh, is be able, because every afternoon he would come out, as long as he was physically able, he would come out and do his giro, his, um, his swing through the Vatican Gardens, praying his rosary. Uh, and it became a kind of standing thing that visitors to him would often accompany him uh, on those moments. I had the opportunity to do that a couple of times. And, and to see his immersion uh, in that prayer was, was a very powerful thing. Um, you know, you talked about every good theology leading to a mystagogy. I think not only did he believe that intellectually, I think he practiced it personally uh, in terms of his own devotional life. Uh, Francis, uh, where you really see, I think, the prayerfulness of Pope Francis most palpably uh, is in his Marian devotion. Um, you know, be, before every international trip he takes, he always goes to the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, St. Mary Major, uh, because that contain, in the Borghese Chapel there, it contains the famous icon of uh, Maria Salus Populi Romani, the Maria Health of the Roman people. Um, and he will sit there in front of that image, mesmerized by it. I mean, you know, if you didn't know any better, I mean, you would almost think there's some kind of epileptic <laughs> seizure going on because he, he seems like, utterly detached from, from any sensory awareness of anything going on around him, right? Um, and it's the same, he always does the same thing when he comes back from a trip, because he always wants to offer up, to, to consecrate the trip to the Virgin before he goes, and to thank her for the success of the trip when he gets back. And, and along the way, I mean, the only time I have seen Pope Francis cry in public uh, was when he went to Brazil for, for World Youth Day um, in 2013. And he went to the chapel of Our Lady of Aparecida, 
uh, and he was praying in front of the Madonna, and this was not long after his election, um, and, and he just lost it. Um, and I think that speaks to the sincerity. I mean, I think like the good Latin American pastor he is, he has this veneration for the Madonna, you know, that is just all surpassing. And I think it's also tied to his biography. I think very much his, his love affair with the Madonna is rooted in his own experience, particularly of his grandmother, and he's talked about that uh, on various occasions. So I think each and their, obviously these are, these are deep men of prayer, different styles, I, you know, I think, Benedict's spirituality, while palpable and real, I think was always a bit more cerebral, you know. Um, it, it wasn't the kind of florid uh, devotion to like the Madonna of Chestahova that you would get from John Paul II, and nor was it the kind of salsa-infused emotive spirituality with the Madonna you get with, with Francis. Equally real, but, but different, ref reflecting the different personalities and different experiences. I mean, look, you know, uh, this is one of the, I think, one of the glories of the Catholic Church. I know that right now that there is this perception, and this lasted the 10 years of Benedict's retirement, you know, there was this perception of some kind of rivalry uh, between the two men, or that with having two popes, the church would somehow fracture into two rival camps. And, and yes, there is, there, is, there is real palpable division in Catholicism, and there's no sense trying to deny it, but frankly, I choose to look at it the other way. I think the glory of the Catholic Church is that we do not have to choose between a Pope Benedict and a Pope Francis, that we have a tradition rich and broad enough to encompass and cherish them both. I think the two men felt that. I think our, our ecclesial life would be a lot healthy if more of us would follow their example and feel it too. So I just have a few housekeeping details to share with you before we conclude. Um, I, I was thinking, as Father Emery was speaking, I'm so happy that these lectures are going to be published in Chicago Studies, because I'll want to read uh, your remarks especially. Uh, many people I, I've- I want to read the first page and a half. Yeah, we can <laughs> cite that. Yeah. <laughs> Put that on your website. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be a permanent link. Um, and. Uh, Julie Vasquez is our editor, and I uh, just want to thank her for her work with uh, Chicago Studies. There's a new issue uh, that uh, just recently was, was published, and, and these talks will be coming out soon. Uh, I'm also happy to say, for those who were not able to make it last night, and for those who are here today, both lectures have been recorded, and uh, we'll be sharing those uh, later. So continue to follow us, our social media, and our website, and you'll find out more about that. Uh, you're welcome to stay around campus if you'd like. Uh, visit the bookstore, uh, visit the Theological Resource Center, the library, and if anyone would like to, you know, I'm told that we are having lunch at noon, and if you want to buy a ticket for lunch, you would be welcome to do that. Tickets for lunch are at the bookstore as well, uh, but lunch will be at, at noon. Um, I'd also want to express uh, public thanks and gratitude for our events and marketing team, especially led by Jillian Frick for putting this all together. Jillian, if you could wave. <laughs> As you know, this is a, this is a major event for us, uh, and especially this week, this week, this year, when we had uh, last night in the city and then this morning here, um, the team really did a great job, so thank you very much. Um, so, Thank you again for joining us. We hope that this was uh, a morning of erudition, but also uh, intellectual creativity and pursuit, and you'll have time to continue to share in the conversation as we move forward later today. So thank you all, and enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>